Are you there, Matt? Can you hear me? I can hear you so loud and clear. It's actually sad. But how are you, my, how are you doing? <laughs> the, the sad part is you can probably see me too, but you can you know cover up my part of the screen if you want. You and me both. I don't know why anyone would want to watch this. We sh it should have been an audio uh, interview. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna have. Well, anyway, uh, <laughs> so so how have you been out there in Los Angeles during this crazy pandemic? I noticed that you've been back to the gym working out. So at least you're getting out of the house somewhat. Just started this week with the gym, and boy, I tell you what, I I, um, I never thought I would enjoy that so much, but I was so sick and tired of being here um, at my little place, uh, you know, running outside, working out, so it's been uh, nice to get into the gym and just have a little bit, you know, the way the 24-hour fitness is doing it, shameless plug, I shouldn't do that, but, um, you know, you got to get in and get out in an hour. So um, it kind of leaves you to uh, not mess around, uh, get in, get your workout in and get out. So it's kind of nice. Oh, well, you know, if you need any workout pointers, you know, I just hit me up, man. I'm happy, you know. Yeah, I, I'm sure that you're in the best physical shape you could possibly be right now, right? And by the way, let me, before we get going, let me take a second, because I know most of the people that are probably watching and listening are fans of yours as opposed to mine. And uh, I just want to say how great it is to see you. I know you've been going through a rough time especially recently with your uh, heart surgery. I want to say it's great to see you. You look good, and we're all wishing you the best uh, for a good and full recovery. Thank you, brother. I really appreciate that. It's been, a, it's been a long year, but, you know, good I'm here. That. So, right on. <laughs> and uh, anyway, so uh, um, are, you, are you from Los Angeles? Did you grow up there in L.A.? I'm a native. I'm a native. Where's it's funny. Uh, back when I played ball. Uh, uh, the, you know, some of the guys, when I played, played for Green Bay and New York and different places, they'd say, you know, you're probably the first California guy that we've met that's actually normal and sort of a cool dude because most of you guys are freaking idiots. <laughs> so, but I am a native. I was born here, um, lived here most of my life. And even when I played ball, I, I actually uh, would always come back to L.A. So, Okay, so you're, you obviously were, you know, an athlete you know you now you're an actor so so going back to when you started were you obviously you're a large guy if you can't tell by looking at him he's he you know you're like six eight you know uh solid muscle much like myself i'm kidding <laughs> uh uh so were you always a standout athlete or was it something that you had to really strive for a little bit of both you know um and what i mean by that is i was the fifth of six boys um, and we were all athletes. So I kind of came in a lineage of guys um, just in my own household who uh, set a standard of kind of excellence in athletics. Um, the funny thing is, is that the oldest was the shortest. And then as we got, as the, you know, as we, the younger guys, we were bigger. Um, so we got all the physical skills or, you know, the, the, the height and everything. But, um, but I battled. I was an okay athlete. Um, and one thing that you'll kind of hear from me as we go along probably is that I never was the standout in, in college. Um, I was never, I, I wasn't drafted into the NFL. Um, I battled every year to, uh, stay on teams and get, you know, battle for playing time. So, you know, like I said, it's, it's both, I obviously had the height and some physical prowess, but I, I had to work hard um, to, to, to maintain that. And uh, uh, like a, for those tuning in, you played, what, 14 years in the NFL, which is yeah. just twice the average career. And we'll, we'll come back to that. But did you ever, were you good enough growing up to, to ever dream that you'd play in a, uh, a Super Bowl and, and, and have that kind of career? Or was that just completely far-fetched? It was for me in the fact that um, I was dreaming of like two man volleyball on the beach court on the beach, mm -hmm. you know, Sinjin Smith and and guys like that. I, I, I really enjoyed being out playing volleyball. I was a skinny kid, you know, had my height probably I was six, seven at 15, um, but weighed about a buck. Eight, you know, buck 60, buck 70. I was really skinny. So it was basketball. And uh, I really enjoyed basketball for a long time. And um, uh, so those were the things I kind of dreamed of. Football, I thought there's no way that I'm going to work myself into uh, that type of player. 
but obviously, you know, you, you get through high school and you kind of see that schools are recruiting you. And, you know, the, the idea, I had a choice when I came out of high school, I could have gone and played basketball at some smaller pack than the pac 10 schools mm -hmm. uh, or, or go to an SC, uh, which is where I went to, you know, end up going uh, and playing ball where I, I didn't know what the future was. You know, I didn't know if I would have, was going to have the talent to get to, to make it. Um, but the long answer of that is I really wasn't sure early on that football was my destiny. Did, did having grown up, growing up with all your, your brothers, did that, was there, I can imagine there was a competitive environment around the house. Did that help you develop, uh, you know, <laughs> it, it, kind of teach it, you how to compete? It taught me how to block and to, <laughs> and to, and to, and to run away. To get, to get the cheap shots in. Right. You know, there was always this hierarchy of, you know, the oldest brother kind of whooped on the, the next, uh, the, actually the next two were twins, but then it kind of always sort of trickled down. And um, kind of by the time it got to me and my younger brother, um, the, you know, the, the, the older ones were sort of, sort of over that. And, and so there wasn't a ton of that. Um, but again, it was more of the legacy, you know, we all went to the same uh, high school, St. Paul High School. Um, and uh and so there was that legacy of what's the next willie gonna do um so it was more of that and sort of the you know that was where i think i developed honestly is the the, the self sort of preservation of i have to do this you know this is something that i have to prove to myself um and i think it, it did kind of start with that pressure of knowing that you were that I was one of the, you know, one of the Willick boys, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, uh, that's one thing that I always like to talk about since I started doing this is, is people that inspire, you know, and to, to, to go where you, on the roads that you've gone on, uh, you know, it takes some real intestinal fortitude. Where, where did that come from? Where did that drive and that ambition go to, to climb the mountains that you've climbed? Where, it hasn't started at an early age. Where did that come from? Shit, Dale. I feel like I should start. I should start laying down now. We're gonna get into serious <laughs> psycho. You'll be, you'll be you'll be you'll be invoiced as well, Mike. I'll be, I'll be crying in a few minutes. <laughs> but honestly, um, you know, I don't want to get too serious. But I think it, um, like everything, it comes from fear. Uh, fear of uh, being the really tall kid early on. You know, like I said, six, I was six, 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 seven in, in eighth, ninth grade and, and having the, that already people looking at you sort of thing. Um, the, and with that comes, uh, it's, it, you know, it's, it's, it's a fight or, fight or flight sort of mentality. You, right. know, you know, it sounds weird coming from someone who, you know, you look at me and I, and I had all these successes, but um, one of my mottos early on was why not me? You know, why not me? Uh, even though I wasn't the most talented physically, um, I, I just felt like if I put my mind to it, and then this is something that goes back to, you know, learning from your parents. I had two great, amazing parents. Um, my father's still living, my mother, mother, mother mom's passed, but um, that was instilled. You know, that sort of mentality was instilled where, you know, you get it done, um, you fight, you battle um and you don't give up kind of thing and and so if you take that along with some physical prowess and the, the ability that way um that, that sort of meshed in itself and and people ask me all the time and i'm getting long-winded here but you know they ask me why did why did i make it as opposed to some of my other brothers who were like i said probably more talented than i was mm -hmm. and i think it was just that desire to see it through you know, that desire to say, this is what I am going to reach for. Um, and, um, you know, like I said, my, my dad was a LAPD uh, cop. Mm. <clears throat> so, and he was a quiet guy growing up, you know, he didn't say a lot. And I think that's where I sort of learned that sort of grind mentality of grinding it out. He, he when he wasn't an LAPD cop, he had a side job. And, you know, when you're raising six kids, um, mm. six boys, uh, you know, the grocery bills alone were, <laughs> were enough to <laughs> stagger a family, you know, and he was a grinder. He was an absolute grinder. And so I think that's where it comes from first. Then it goes down to my brothers and, uh, and it went from there.
Well, you know, it, it's a great story, Matt. And, and, you know, I know people don't like talking about themselves, but I always hear from people after my interviews, like how inspirational it is, you know, to hear your story and how you got, you know, from point A to point B, you know, because it inspires people. I learn from it. But so in high school, uh, you were a standout athlete and you could have played basketball, some smaller schools. Was that ever a serious decision or was it like I get a chance to play football at USC, like the number one football school? I got to take that. You know, I, I, I felt that pressure of, of that because I really did love basketball. It was my first love. And I thought, um, you know, <clears throat> six, seven white guy who can't really jump all that well <laughs> versus six, seven football player who could probably bulk up to 300 pounds um, if need be. Uh, I just really honestly, yeah, it came down to where I thought um, – so it might take me further, you know, and then I thought, obviously, you know, having an SC education, having an education from a bigger school would benefit me. Um, should I not have gone? But uh, but it was a tough decision. Um, I went to a football school that made it harder. Um, so there were some expectations there. But uh, some of my funnest times that I had in high school were on the basketball court. So there was a tough decision. Um, but once I kind of made that, once I kind of said, okay, I think football is the route for me, you know, sort of the basketball sort of looky lose scholarship offers, things like that sort of faded away. And then it only became, you know, uh, a question of what football school I would go to. Um, so. Could you have, did you get a lot of scholarship offers? Uh, obviously USC is the best of the best. But could you have pretty much picked anywhere or was it because they were no, in your backyard? No, again, and that's the beginning of, of the story of, you know, had a lot of, had some talent, but wasn't quite the star that you would expect or, or whatever. And, um, you know, I had some good schools, um, probably half of the Pac-10 at that time. It's hard to say Pac-12 these days, but uh, you know, <laughs> half of that league, um, Nebraska, you know, Oklahoma's those, those schools like that. And then there were a few randoms, but um, yeah, I basically the way it went was I was being recruited heavily in it by Arizona who at the time Larry Smith was the coach. And um, he then got the job in the interim of the recruiting process, left Arizona and went to SC. And so that's how that kind of came about where when they moved over and he kept recruiting me hard, uh, that sort of, to me, was a, uh, you know, it was one of those moments where you go, oh, shit, they're still interested. You yeah, know, they're, still, yeah. they're still following me around, you know, and so that right. kind of, that kind of piqued me, and so that, and then, you know, started getting into the lore. I actually thought it for a while I was going to go to, to UCLA. Um, I was a UCLA fan for a while, and uh, uh, so that was kind of where I was leaning at first, um, but I, I truly am glad that I made the decision I did and, and went to SC. And again, uh, furthering the story along, I got to SC and uh, was a tall, skinny. Uh, some of the guys make fun of me because I was actually, I came in as a linebacker at 6'7", 245 pounds or something. Wow. You know, and they used to call me Ted Hendricks and stuff like that because that was the only sort of <laughs> person they could think of who could play that. And then about four days later, I was moved down to defensive line, and I ended up playing defensive lineman uh, at, at SC, which was kind of probably more I was more suited for. Mm -hmm. so. Well, once you got there and you made the decision, you're going to USC. Uh, so that that had to fulfill the first part of your dreams. Like that doesn't get much better than that, especially growing up locally in Los Angeles. You're playing at historically the best top three football school. Once you got there. Were you able to compete right away? Did you feel overwhelmed at any time? Like, maybe I don't belong here. What was that process like? Yeah, 100%. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I, I just realized that uh, I, I, I stopped and looked around at the talent around me, and I thought, holy shit, I'm in trouble here. Um, you know, junior sale, we, we were roommates my freshman year. So we came in together. And at that point, um, there were – at least two All-Americans at D-line with another couple of guys who were really good ball players, And behind them were, you know, like I said, there were, there were All-Americans all around me. So I, I, at that point, thought I'd made a mistake. 
uh, maybe I should reconsider basketball. <laughs> and, uh, and it took me a couple of years to really get out of that. Um, I, you know, I kind of floundered a little bit uh, with my abilities. Um, the strength wasn't coming the way I wanted it to. So I was battling behind that still kind of pretty thin, uh, not having the strength or the speed. And I'm like, well, that's a double negative. Like that's not going to work. <laughs> um, so yeah, so that, that I had, to, there were a couple, so there were some dark days, uh, wondering whether or not I'd made the right decision. Did you ever, um, did you ever seriously think about quitting at that time? I, I really did. I, I, I you know, I, I, I wouldn't call it quitting. Uh -huh. I, I was thinking like, maybe I'm going to transfer somewhere, mm -hmm. you know, maybe I'm going to make it so that I can kind of figure out where I fit um, so that I can enjoy football for a few more years uh, before it's all over, mm -hmm. you know? And, sure. um, and so that was a consideration. Um, and I kind of kept that to myself for the most part. And, uh, but then again, I, I, you know, something sort of clicked and I don't even know what it was. I think maybe just the idea of sticking with it, um, sort of just putting your head down and grinding, mm -hmm. going back to that theme. Mm -hmm. um, and then I started gaining some more weight. Uh, I started getting on the field just a little bit and having that, you know, uh, sort of uh, reward uh, and that sort of feeling of getting on the field, getting some uh, some love that way. And... Um, and it probably wasn't till my end of my junior season that I thought, you know, I might be able to do this at another level. I had a coach that uh, was at SC, excuse me, had my first drink of the day, by the way. Well, what is that, Jack and Coke? It's five o'clock somewhere. <laughs> uh, uh, today it's a, uh, what am I drinking? A, uh, a mule. I'm drinking oh, a, a Moscow a, mule. A, it's a Jameson mule, an Irish mule. Anyway, I digress. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I had an, an offensive line coach who at the time said, Matt, if you're going to make it in the NFL, you got to move over to offensive line. And again, I was only, I was 6'7", you know, maybe 280 at that point, 275, which sounds big, but if mm -hmm. you're going to play, you know, at the next level, that's still pretty thin. And I thought, there's no way I can do that. Um, so... I ended up, you know, finishing my career uh, at SC as a defensive lineman, and had some pretty good success um, my junior and senior year, and 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 was a kind of a fifty percent player. I'd start sometimes, and I'd back up and play during the games, and kind of again was never the star at any point at SC. So, which is which is so interesting. I mean, but and and that's something that that I've learned, like. You know, when things are dark, I mean, you know, you keep pushing and eventually the light's going to come on, you know, and that's what it sounds like what happened to you. It's, you know, it seemed like you were possibly overwhelmed, but you kept digging and digging and then, you know, you broke through. So, um, so as you, as you got, to, as you got to your senior year, who, who was the coach then? I'm sorry, I'm drawing a blank. No, it was, it was Larry Smith, who I okay. spoke about earlier, who was uh, still the coach there, the head coach. Yeah. Okay. And how was, uh. How was Junior Seau at that time? Of course, we're going to be a Hall of Fame and then, you know, die tragically. But how, how was he way back in the beginning of his career? He was a wild man. Um, he was at the time he uh, was what they considered Prop 48, which means he was ineligible the first uh, year mm -hmm. uh, because of grades. And we roomed together. And he was um, a not very polished, you know, Polynesian uh, wearing lava lava skirts and um, bringing his uh, fruity island pebble uh, cereal to, <laughs> to the room and uh, yeah no we there's a qu there's a quick story that I have told in the past basically about Junior and, and I loved Junior uh, we had a great you know freshman year together um, but he he uh, I had to pull him out of a party one time where he punched a hole in the wall. Uh, cause he was getting ready to kill somebody, uh, and ended up breaking his hand, uh, and had to be put in a cast and we kind of lied our way through what actually happened and, uh, you know, how the circumstances <laughs> behind it and everything. Luckily he was, uh, again, he, because he was prop 48, he wasn't really practicing with us and everything, but, uh, he was a scared guy. Like we all were, you know, at 18 coming into a new situation and trying to figure it all out. 
obviously he went on to uh, be one of the best football players uh, that's ever played the game. And so it was, it's an interesting thing uh, to have seen that, you know, firsthand and watch him develop and sort of his star rise pretty quickly. Did you stay in contact with him after, after college? Is your, Cause you both played forever in the NFL. We did. And, and uh, you know, I didn't, I kind of lost contact with him for a little while and here's a funny story. And I'm, you know, to, to this is one of those uh, telling the truth moments, but um mm -hmm. I got pissed at Junior. I was uh, upset with him for a while because he sort of, uh, he tried to big time me one time uh, during a game. Uh, and what I mean by that is he uh, sort of ignored me on the field, like he didn't know me. <laughs> and uh, it, it was one of those interesting things. And, and it kind of, it happened and, and, and uh, he walked right by me like he didn't even know it. And, you know, there could have been, a million reasons why that happened, sure. but at the time I was like, you know, "F you, man! What the? Yeah, f we room together. I pulled you out of a, you know, all these things." Sure. Um, and you're in the NFL. But, like, come on! You're, it's not like you're sitting right, in the stands. Right. I mean, right. we're just here. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. It's not like you don't remember me. Yeah. But but uh, but uh, you know, and then the next year we kind of uh, we ended up uh, making peace and talking and everything, but. Uh, and then I saw him a couple of times down in San Diego. Uh, we'd meet up or I'd see him at his, uh, his sales place that he had down there, his restaurant and everything. But, you know, Junior was a, uh, as the stories have come out, he was somewhat of a really private guy. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, looking back on it, he always had some sort of demons that were sort of lurking. Um, you know, when we talk another issue altogether is the whole CTE issue that right. you know, football has, has done. And, and I, one thing I've noticed, cause I've had three or four friends uh, that have, that have died either literally from, you know, diagnosed CTE or something around that. Um, most of them had those personality issues that you could look at and go, eh, that was, I saw sort of a dichotomy of, of, right. of, of personalities that sort of lent itself to that. But again, mm -hmm. that's a whole other issue. Right. Um, well, thank you for sharing that. That's, that's so interesting. Um, so were you expecting to get drafted after your USC career or what? Well, we'll again, an another, another, another sort of time where I thought uh, might happen, mm -hmm. you know, just give me a shot sort of mentality. And um uh the the draft you know back then was 12 rounds uh it's only i think eight now um mm -hmm. so there was even more you know a chance to get drafted and it came and went um draft came and went and i was not drafted which you know it, it's weird I, I i had a there was that 50 50 of thought it might happen what am i gonna do next versus you know shit, I'm pissed, man. I, I deserve a chance. Mm -hmm. The way that I sort of uh, got into the league and I always uh, uh, oh, this gentleman a, a, a uh, anyways, I digress too. Basically, I, I a guy who worked for, uh, for USC at the time was a, a coach and then worked in the administration. He had worked for the New York Jets and uh, he ended up calling them or they spoke and they said, you got anybody? And he said, Hey, I got Matt Willig. Now he is not the, the best athlete in the world, uh, but he's going to come in and he's going to work his ass off for you. He will, uh, he, he, he's a worker bee. And uh, at the very least you'll get a camp body. Mm -hmm. out of him. And again, there was sort of that, really, am I only a camp body? Am I only here just to serve it, you know, for a couple of months and then I'm gone or is there more? And, um, there was nobody else calling, you know? Uh, so I ended up going to New York my first, uh, my first season and, uh, as a defensive end. Really? Uh, yeah. And, and, and again, realizing that I was a six, seven white boy with not a lot of speed. Um, even though I led the preseason in, I, I will say this, I led the preseason in sacks, even though most of them were fourth quarter scrub time sacks. Uh, hey, it doesn't matter. Right? Most people don't, they're not going to ask, but, and, and so the story goes that, um, I, it was probably our fourth week into camp 
and I was struggling. And again, I had those moments, Dale, where it was like, what am I doing here? This is not working out. Uh, this is, I should need to start planning for my future. Um, whatever that is, you know, I was missing home. I was in New York, couldn't be further away from, from LA. Uh, you know, missing girlfriends, missing family, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And, but again, I, I got on the field and I would work my ass off and I would do the best I could. About four weeks into camp, uh, they came to me and said, look, we're gonna let you go. We're gonna release you. But before we do that, we're going to uh, give you a little, it was basically a 15 minute tryout after practice one day where they had me do offensive line drills with the offensive line coach. And it was me and another guy and uh, from that sort of 15 minute, you know, blocking and, and, and such a drill, uh, they said, hey, we're gonna release you, send you back to California for a week, and then we're gonna bring you back on our practice squad, uh, which basically means that you're gonna practice for the year and you won't play, um, you know, you're just there kind of as a body, but you're gonna be here all year and we're gonna develop you. And, you know, and, to me, that was the best news ever. That was something that I, I've got my chance now, mm -hmm. you know. And um, it was—it's a funny story because I still get a guy who for, who worked uh, with the team back then who would drive us to the airport. You know, you got released, and there was there was a caravan of six or seven or ten guys that got released, and they were all going to the airport. Basically, their careers were somewhat over, and they were all you know down the dumps and 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 pretty upset. And I had a smile on my face because I knew I was going home for a week. Yeah, and, and I was coming back, so I yeah. had no problem with that, you know. And <laughs> the guy, the guy, he says, "I always remember you looking and having this smile on your face, like a shitty grin, that like something we didn't know." And that's when I kind of said, "Yeah, I knew I was coming back." Mm -hmm. So that was that was the beginning of my career. That was how I started. I, I spent the first year on the practice squad and and um, learned how to play offensive line in the NFL. Well, that's I didn't realize that I was gonna because our paths almost crossed. Uh, I, I, um, before I moved out to Los Angeles, I worked in, in television and sports at the CBS affiliate Houston. And okay. at the time uh, we had the Warren Moon show and the Jack Party right. show. So as yep. part of the deal with the Houston Oilers, I got to travel on their charter jet to their away games and stay in the team hotel. It was right like as close as I could get to being part of the team without being on the practice squad. <laughs> right. and so, and, and that year, 93 turned out to be the craziest season in history. I mean, you had against the Jets, uh, the last game of the season, you had the, the deep, you had uh, Buddy Ryan slugging Kevin Gilbride on the sidelines. Right. You had uh, Jeff Alm earlier that year killing himself. Right. I don't know if you ever crossed paths with him or not. He was a yeah. Notre Dame linebacker. Killed was himself he, in the middle of the season. He was, a, he was a Notre Dame guy? Yeah. He went to Notre yeah, Dame. Yeah. yeah. So committed, committed to suicide in the middle of the season. Right. Uh, you had Baby Gate where David Williams missed a game because his wife gave birth, which at the time was unheard of. That was big national news. And you had just, you had two uh, gay guys on the team. I mean, it wasn't public, but everyone knew it. Really? And, yeah. And I'm not going to mention any names, but. No, uh, it's fine. A buddy of mine from SC, Gary Wellman, was on the team. Yes, he was. He yep. was. In fact, uh, I remember him because the, I remember when he we wasn't, played. Him. He wasn't one of them. <laughs> no. <laughs> hey, I know Gary. It might have been one of them. <laughs> no, no, I remember because Gary uh, ended up torching uh, us when I was with the Jets. Uh, when we played out there in Houston, he tortured us for uh, like 150 yards uh, receiving that year. But yeah, uh, that's funny. That's yeah, you're right. Our, our paths almost crossed. Yeah, had you had you been on the squad for that, you know, been at that game? I mean, anyway, that whole '93 season was. I could write a book about it with all those things happening. You know, Mike Rozier's running back pulled a gun. Well, I was on, on that, squad. but I was on that. I was on that. I was on that team. Yeah, yeah, that's crazy. Um, yeah. Anyway, so I, I digress. Sorry about that. But no, no, it's good, man. That's 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 it's good. That's good information. That's that's classic. Yeah, that that was quite a time though. That '93 Oilers team, and um, so. You're a single guy living in New York, away from home for the first time. Really, what is that like to to be in the Big Apple? You know, uh, just all alone. Was it was it a bad thing because you're all alone, or was it a good thing because you're a, a jet and you're a single guy? 
It, it started out, you know, terrifying um, because there is no question that the the lifestyle of New York, especially at that time, was completely different than anything I had experienced, you know, here in LA um, and being a slave back Californian. Um, so just just dealing with people was an issue, uh, and then you know traveling you know we used to we lived in we lived on long island but then you know our games were in new jersey so you had to co you had to drive through manhattan and in, in, in the city so just the traveling aspect and again this is 92 93 um so there was no gps or all that stuff so just getting around was was a was a bitch um mm -hmm. but then again switched the other side and it was pretty cool uh being a single guy, uh, I had a girlfriend back home, um, and I ended up. Anyway, uh, <laughs> um, let, let, let's do. Let's go there. Let's dig into that. That looked comfortable. I'm joking. No, no, I, no. I ended up marrying her. Uh, uh, but, but, so, so, so that was kind of weird that way. But I, we, I had a great time. That was still back uh, when going into Manhattan and going into the city was an ordeal and an event. You know, clubs like the Limelight were still going on um, uh, where, you know, we'd see the likes of, it was crazy the people we would see, you know. That's back when OJ was running around crazy and we'd see him in New York and all these other uh, stars and celebrities that would, that would, that would uh, show up. Uh, so it was a lot of fun. We had a, we had a good time. We had a good time. Um, but uh you know, at the same time, Dale, I was still pretty focused on kind of on being a football player and kind of making my mark and kind of figuring out how I turn this opportunity into something that's going to last. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to be at that point. Now the fear of failure was there of, okay, I've, I've kind of made it, but what am I going to do with it? Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, that there was, a, there was a lot of fun involved, but there was also some serious work involved with it too oh i i can't imagine um so the first year you're on the practice squad you're learning a new position you're trying not to party too much uh did everything go as you planned and you go to camp the next year uh trying to make the team and how did how did that go from that it did it started to kind of that's when it started to sort of um you know they were sort of high on me i guess they were you know the, the i was still working towards being what they wanted me to be number one which was a starter and number two sort of my skills were getting better uh i was bringing sort of that defensive mentality to the offensive line which they liked so i was i was aggressive mm -hmm. and uh it didn't mind you know scrapping with the guys and, and being physical and stuff like that so that part was it was coming along pretty well i was still playing behind a couple of uh, veteran players um so i knew that you know it almost was a relief a little bit because I knew I still probably had another season or another year to kind of progress and to learn the skills and kind of become a really good player or at least a good enough player. And so, you know, uh, there was a lot more comfort um, from that first year. I still have the, uh, you know, every year we, we'd get ID cards uh, because we'd go into the, to the in New York, you'd go into the commons in, in preseason and you'd show your car that you were a you know New York Jet employee. And I kid with the my buddies now because uh, I'll show them these cards that from the rookie year picture, which was me, clean face, short hair, looking <laughs> curious, to the next year where I have sunglasses on, my hat's backwards, and I got I got a shaved Mohawk head. You know, so that gives you a little idea of my comfortability sort of going from year one <clears throat> to year two. You, you let you let your inner Southern California out. After right, ex there. Exactly. That's exactly what it was. I was able <laughs> to kind of become a little bit more, show a little bit more of me. So back in those days, and I've been a huge NFL fan my entire life, but the game was so different then. It's so, it was so much tougher. You yeah. could hit, you know, and nowadays, like you can't really hit people. You know, the, everything's a penalty. Uh, you know, you watch the game today compared to when you played, and what's that like for you? It's frustrating. It's definitely frustrating. Um, 
I, I think the game, I, I think players are faster and stronger than they've ever been. <clears throat> and uh, excuse me. Um, and that's amazing to me that they're, the, 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 even when I played, I used to marvel at watching film and go, how are more guys not hurt every game? Mm -hmm. I'm amazed at that because of the speed and the strength the guys have. But, you know, it's a progression of things. You know, if the game is to survive today, uh, part of that is necessary, you know, um, because of the speed and strength being what it is, guys can get killed. And although I hate to say it, and I, because I am a purist uh, of the game and, and, and appreciate the old days of the great hits and the quarterbacks getting killed, uh, you know, some of it's necessary. I think they, they've almost gone too far with it. And that's the shame is, is the inconsistency of being, you know, what, what taking down a, a, a quarterback this second late and, and, and throwing him a penalty you know, uh, is disturbing to me and, and, uh, and sucks to watch. Mm -hmm. But again, if this game is to survive moving forward, you know, uh, kids aren't playing it as much anymore. They really, they really are. I think there's always going to be an element where um, inner cities, kids without uh, the opportunities to play field hockey, uh, lacrosse, mm -hmm. volleyball has become huge. All these other sports – that are sort of that are the parents are putting their kids into has really changed the idea of what football is going to look like in the future. So that's a long way to answer. It's frustrating, but it's still the best game. Still enjoy watching it. Um, yeah. You know, I still uh, looking forward to hopefully this season gets going, which I was talking to my brother uh, yesterday about going to a couple games. He lives in Denver. Maybe go out to a Denver game. Maybe go to Carolina and catch a game. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, and uh, while we're talking about today's game, like it's also becomes more and more political and seems like it's just going to continue to. Uh, as far as, you know, guys kneeling, you know, for the national anthem, what are your thoughts on that? Would you, would we see a Matt Willard kneeling? Uh, or is that just too, too, you know, far removed from you to answer? See, this is, if you had graphics, this is where like political, political would pop up on the screen. But <laughs> we'll, we'll edit it out later. <laughs> now, uh, you would not find me kneeling. Um, uh, I have too much respect for uh, what the flag is, what the national anthem means, and what it's meant in the past. Um, I think there's a time and a place. And... Um, and I don't think it's there. Now, having said that, um, you know, it, it's it's the way that you do it. It's in it's in your intentions. And I think that the way that um, going back to Colin Kaepernick and the way that that whole thing started, um, I thought it started with selfish motivation. Um, and based on that. Um, I had a hard time with it. And I, again, there's no question that in today's society that the, 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 the fight and struggle for uh, racial equality uh, is absolutely needed, is, uh, is warranted, um, but there is a way to do it. And there is a means to it that, uh, that, you know, there's certain things I believe in and, and kneeling during the national anthem is not one of them. And also you grew up, your, your dad was a police officer. So, you know, I, I'm sure you learned discipline and you do things the right way. And that can also divide a locker room. You know, if you have half the guys kneeling, the other half not kneeling, that could cause a divide. And that's the last thing you want. I could not imagine, Dale, at this point, um, ha having to deal with that as a team uh, or having teammates having to deal with that. Because you do battle with uh, respecting, you know, adult, an adult making a decision um, based on his beliefs and, and things like that uh, versus uh, the degradation, I guess is, it's a pretty strong word, but, you know, the falling apart of a team, of, 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 a, of a, a team that has a certain goal in mind and, um, you know, even when I played, there were things that divided a locker room. 
Um, but I can't imagine something as serious and as uh, worldly, I guess, mm -hmm. um, as, as the race issue is right now and, and what that means for, for a lot of NFL players and how you deal with that while showing respect. And um, I think that's kind of what I battle with with all of this is the respect on both sides, mm -hmm. you know. Um, the respect that I have a different opinion and uh, or at least a different opinion about how we all go about the change mm -hmm. and and how that comes and uh, you know so it's tough I've had uh, personal conversations with um, or some 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 I guess some messaging with a couple of ball players friends of mine who don't want to hear uh, sound bites or, or things that uh, oppose uh, their view. And I respect that again. I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to sit here and, and try and uh, belittle their, their feelings um, to live as a black American uh, in today's society uh, is, has challenges, uh, but it's also the greatest country in the world and has the, ability for each and every individual to rise up past your circumstances and uh and succeed both in a financial and worldly way as well as spiritually so that's my political rant <laughs> no but very well said and, and thank you for for sharing that insight with us i mean it's very insightful given your 14-year career and, and i'm just i was just curious and the with this pandemic, you know, do you even see us having a normal season? Is there going to be crowd? I mean, people in the stand, and, and I understand it's all speculation at this point. Nobody knows anything. But where, where, where do you see the yeah, season going? It, it changes every day, doesn't it? Or every week. Um, I, I hope so. I really do. I hope so. I hope, you know, the fan situation is another thing. Um, I, I uh, again, I just I told you I just had a conversation with my, my brother about where we're going to go, and and one of my other brothers said, well, <laughs> there's, they're not going to allow fans in the stadium. I think if there's any sport that could not, I don't know, that would that would just seem absolutely foreign to me is not having fans in a football stadium, but the idea of not having it versus that, it, it, you know, is is. <laughs> is not an alternative. So I don't know. I, it, it, I think we're going to have it. I think there'll be some semblance of, of having it, but who knows what kind of, uh, what kind of fan uh, involvement there's going to be. Mm. Do you see them having games without uh, fans? I, I if, yeah. if that's the only thing, only chance they've got, I see them doing that before they cancel the games because they're not going to lose that revenue. That's, right. that's my my opinion, but again, not, no, not to show it, anything. And, and I think you're right. I think the the, uh, the, the, the the TV revenue is going to come first, no matter whether we think it is or not. Uh, TV revenue is first, and then um, and then fan involvement will, will will come after that. You know, I, I'm hoping. I, I hope we do, but it's coming. It's coming quick. Before we know it, it's going to be August, and uh, and we're going to be on our way. And so, mm -hmm. I think uh, I'm hoping for the best. I think they'll CGI an audience in there before they'll cancel games. I mean, it's all about revenue. I mean, that, what a, what a segue goes. to the uh, to the acting world. Yes, that's yeah. Right. I've been in commercials <laughs> where they just they'll put up cardboard uh, cardboard <laughs> cutouts of fans. That that may be all that's left for us. So, speaking <laughs> of the pandemic, did you know we have a sponsor for the show now? You do this uh, germ star because it's a, it's a changed world now. Like we all, you know, we, we have to, we have to, uh, you know, purell our hands, you know, right. disinfect all the time. And so germ star, if you go to first clean solutions, you've got this little guy right here. It's a cosmopolitan smells good, moisturizes. You don't be walking around with this thing all the time, you know, that leaks, yeah. it's goopy spills. So go to germ star. It's great, man. It's a little thing right here. You can refill it firstcleansolutions.com uh, and they'll hook you up. So, firstcleansolution.com. Firstcleansolution.com. That's I'm our in. little commercial. So uh, uh, thanks for indulging me in that. Uh, sure. So going back to your career, so you get a couple years with uh, the Jets under your belt. Yeah. Um, 
how did that go? So you're an offensive lineman from here on out. Yeah, I'm an offensive lineman, and I will I will summarize my career as this: I was a good player. Um, I had some 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 really good seasons uh, personally, um, but one of the stigmas on my career was that um, out of the 14 years, I think I had 10 different head coaches. And when you're a non-drafted um, sort of uh, kid coming out uh, who has been battling to, so I went through, I played four years with the Jets, um, kind of became a starter my third year, um, fourth year, a new coach comes in, doesn't like me. Uh, I battle for playing time, get benched for a few games because they like the other guy, come back and play. Um, then move to another team, uh, Atlanta. They're high on me. Uh, I play. Um, next season comes in. Uh, Dan Reeves becomes the coach. June Jones is the coach the first season. Then Dan Reeves is the coach. He hates me, which the feeling was mutual. Uh, I didn't like Dan at all for many reasons I won't really get into other than he liked to have spies in the locker room, which to me was a uh, – indication of his whole personality but that's another okay. thing he had a lot of success. he had a lot of success um i go to green bay for a year um just after they came off some super bowls we end up losing to the 49ers and what was a big playoff game um that season were you, were you blocking for Brett Favre at that time? i was a backup I, I i didn't play a lot uh but again you know it's funny because these were my sort of my real the years that I was playing good ball, but yet I wasn't able to get on the field, which was very frustrating. So I did play, uh, Brett was there, had um, some really good times with those guys. Uh, Mark Shimura, Brett Favre, Frank Winters, a couple of other guys, uh, a couple of other linemen that I, I played with, Mike Rivera, Mike Flanagan, some other guys. Anyways, I'm, gonna try, I'm trying to run through the stops for you, Dad, because I know we don't want to do the whole thing. <laughs> Stop me if you want me to, but played a year there. Um, ended up going to uh, the Rams, so we'll we'll slow down there. I ended up, I wasn't getting uh, picked up for the next season. Um, ended up getting the season starts in 1999, and I'm on the bench. I'm I'm at home. Um, get a call to go play for the Rams. They need me as a backup. Um, was a backup the whole season, never hardly played at all. Um, so we ended up going to the Super Bowl and winning. Unbelievable moment, unbelievable season, watching the greatest show on turf, Kurt Warner, that whole thing. Um, I had a backseat to it. I was uh, on the team, but felt sort of not part of the team because I wasn't playing. You know, when you're, when you're an athlete at that level, you want to play. You want to be involved. You want to feel like you're – participating and, and helping the team and I wasn't so I battled with having one of the greatest moments of my life going and winning a Super Bowl versus not playing and uh and and having sort of that sort of uh way against me I'll tell you a quick story uh I was in the locker room uh during the Super Bowl before the Super Bowl game and at that point they didn't even dress me out um, I ended up wearing a jersey. That jer that that jersey that you see yeah. was me doing this and the thing. Yeah, <laughs> that, was, that was for the Super Bowl. Uh, uh, I was doing an interview. Anyways, yeah, I was sitting in the locker room and I and I I was down. I was having the thoughts of gone. You know, this is not the way this moment should be going for me. Uh, at that point, I'd been in the league now. You know, six, seven, eight years now. And mm -hmm. um, uh, Dick Vermeil came up to me, uh, who was the head coach. Mm -hmm. and uh, sat down next to me, and he said, hey, I just want to let you know, I know this has been a frustrating year for you because um, I know you're talented, and uh, I just want to say that this team needed you. Um, uh, we're glad we have you, and I know that the players are as well. The guys that you get along with really well here are happy, and, and knowing that you uh, were a backup for us all year and, and could be counted on, is something that I won't forget. This is Dick Vermeil saying this. So um, that, oh, that's fantastic. That was yeah. That was one of those moments that I just kind of it 
you know, you need those sort of things. You need those sort of moments that 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 little statement alone. And that was the kind of guy that Dick Vermeil was. And I'm sure that there's thousands of guys that have had moments like that with with Coach Vermeil, uh, because that's he did care and he did uh, take the time for those little moments uh, mm -hmm. with a lot of guys. And so it was just that alone that kind of made me feel like uh, like there was a purpose for being there and it was part of my journey. So. Yeah. Well, and those those people that don't know, uh, that team was not just a, a Super Bowl champion, but one of the most prolific teams in history. I mean, it, right. it was just it was called, as you referenced, the greatest show on turf, and broke records, and was just you know very iconic team to, that you were a part of. To sit and watch those guys, uh, my teammates, do what they were doing, um, was astounding. Even as a guy who's seen it all, had seen it all, you know, to watch them. Uh, score points like they did, um, and, and and a hell of a defense, by the way, that mm -hmm. year as well. Uh, it wasn't like they were one-sided. Uh, was was amazing to watch that that team uh, get to where they got and, and see them ultimately. I see. I see. I'm, I'm saying they like it was them, and that, that I wasn't part of it. But but again, to see the team kind of go all the way like that was was pretty amazing. And you know. Again, you may know this, and I don't know if anybody else does, but the way they started the season, you know, with Kurt Warner being a no-name backup, mm -hmm. um, uh, when uh, I, why am I blanking on his name? I'm Not blanking Kurt. on it too. Uh, uh, geez, he's an announcer was now. It, was it Jim Everett? Was it? No, no. <laughs> um, I'll think of it. Anyway, yeah. So to to have them start out the way they did, uh, and then and then have such a magical season was amazing. So, so that took me to 2000. And, uh, so then, uh, after that, uh, where did I go then? See, even I forget. I ended up going to Carolina, Carolina Panthers. Uh, same thing. I was at home, uh, decided to take my uh, wife and new baby, uh, to a, uh, get on a, get an RV and take a trip up the coast. And we got one day into our trip and I got a call saying, Carolina wants you tomorrow. <laughs> and they had already started camp so i was like i'll tell you i, I actually bargained with them i said look i'm going to spend one night in an rv with my with, with my family and uh, then tomorrow i'll drive back and i'll see you in two days and um carolina was a great experience uh we ended up uh i, I missed what did i miss i know you know i missed uh, uh the 49ers see mm -hmm. I missed the 49ers. I went to the 49ers first and had a great experience there. Um, yeah, yeah San, San Francisco is a beautiful, one of my favorite cities. I, I you know, it was a perfect thing for me. Uh, uh, having uh, Coach Mariucci, you know, be the head coach and sort of uh, the 49ers pride themselves on, uh, at that point, being a, a veteran driven team, a team that, that took care of their players. And it's, that was still, it was on the tail end of that, but they were still doing that. And it was perfect for me. And I came in and for the next couple of years, started on and off, backed up a really good player in Derek Deese, who was a teammate of mine at USC and ended up playing for the 49ers for several years. And I played a lot and was part of the team and felt really good and, uh, and played a couple of years there and was going to resign with them after a couple of years. Um, I was thinking of a story about T.O. that I was going to tell, but uh, Terrell, uh, Terrell Owens. No, I, I, I have a couple of myself of him. Do you really? Yeah. No, yeah. go ahead. I'd love to hear it. Is it PG? It is. It is. It is. It's just a funny story. because and, and, and I'm sure if he was to hear this, he would balk at it. He'd say, that, that didn't happen. But uh, we were, I was part of a big group that played dominoes. And uh, the first year I was there in San Francisco, I was sort of new. And, you know, T.O., if you know anything about Terrell Owens, one of the best athletes I've ever seen in my life, uh, but just could run his mouth for no reason at all. And, mm -hmm. uh, and to make a long story short, we were playing dominoes and I said something and he sort of, he mouthed off and said something that was pretty, sort of like who the f are you kind of thing mm -hmm. um and 
I, I grabbed him and I pulled him aside. I don't think I did it right there, but I pulled him aside and I said, listen, listen, man, I've been in this league for about eight years. Don't you ever disrespect me like that again in front of people. I don't deserve that. And I, and I respect you. That kind of, one of those conversations, you know, it was quick. Yeah. And from that day on, man, he, him and I got along really well. Um, you know, he thought of me as crazy Willig. And uh, it's just one of those things where <laughs> the T.O., you know, guys like that, if you don't kind of put them in their place or at least uh, sh- pull them aside and say, not not on my watch kind of thing. He, so that he, was an he, he, can be a, he can be a bully or at least, he, you know, could. And I think that comes from the fact that he's one of the most scared people in the world. That, that again, another uh, psych, psychoanalyst. Well, in, in your size, what six, six, yeah. eight? You know, you, you probably don't have many people stepping to you. You know, to begin no. with. So. No, it, it, but again, you know, that's the way that some guys act is that they, they feel like they can they can verbally get get away with anything they want to, and this, as long as you sort of stand up, stand your ground, and sort of uh, tell them how it's it's at least it's how it's not going to be. Yeah, uh, I thought that was that was a funny story, and I, and I love to you know, to this day. I think he's he's great guy but but again so anyway uh, did you did you ever have like an actual fight you know uh you know uh where i was at your buddy or like a little skirmish on the football field or well just in general you know however you to, to define a fight i'm just curious because i can't imagine anybody coming at you you know it's i'll tell you one of the last fights i ever had and this is was this, is this <laughs> I'll try to make this quick. Um, I was with one of my best friends in the world, Pat Harlow. We went, to, we went to college together. We played against each other in high school and I was the best man in his wedding. And uh, we've been close friends for a long time. He was playing for the, uh, he was a number one draft pick for the uh, Patriots. I was in New York. So I'm, you know, I'm 24 years old and that's going back, you know, half my life. This is one of the last fights I've ever had. <laughs> we come out of a bar at 2.30 in the morning uh, on Long Island. And, it's, and he's 6'7", 285, 290. So it's two of us walking out. Car comes by as, he's, as we're walking to our car. Car rolls by us in front, and he doesn't have his lights on. So we – and I'm, this is the honest truth. We didn't do it in a mean way. We tapped the guy's car and said, hey, turn your lights on. The car stops pulls in reverse, comes back, and there's four guys in a car. And one of the driver starts immediately just mouthing off and, and talking smack. And, you know, this goes on for about a minute or two where we're saying, just go, get out of here, man. You don't want any of this, you know. Kind yeah. of thing. And, and they're like, they're throwing every obscenity they can, you know. F this and F you and mm-hmm. we'll kick your ass and all this crazy stuff. They get out of the car. We proceed, the two of us proceed to beat four guys to a pulp. (laughs) And one of the part of the funny story is that that my buddy always says, I'll never forget out of the corner of my eye, you punching someone and in the same sort of motion, kicking another guy who was coming at you. So I literally punched a guy and then kicked another guy in the same motion. Now, I don't condone You're like a superhero, like an action star preparing for Hollywood. It was a superhero moment. I'll never forget (laughs) it. I'll take credit for it for as long as I live. Um, But truly, it was one of the last fights that we ever got in, uh, that I I was ever in. Now, I've had some some close ones, and I've had to grab a few people by the neck and by the throat because it's amazing to me the – the balls on, on people. Uh, and usually, as you probably know, that they're usually the smallest guy in the room with the biggest attitude. And I will do everything to avoid a fight. But once uh, you go to a certain point, I had a guy a couple of years ago who uh, sat in my seat at a bar and wouldn't get out, even though my buddy said, hey, my buddy went to the bathroom. He's coming right back. And they said, he can make me. I mean, who does that? And Did I got you- back. I got back and I, you know, and I very politely said, hey, man, when you get a chance, can you get out of my seat? I was sitting there in front of the bathroom and he pulled uh, make me. I'm not moving. And, you know, at that point, you just say this guy wants trouble. 
and I ended up yanking the chair out from under him and uh, you know, whatever. I, I'm not, I'm not, again, I'm not trying to condone what I'm saying. It just, it happens. You try to avoid it. Um, I just think those guys are idiots. I mean, I know how big, if I was your size, I'd be a bully. I'd be beating up everybody. (laughs) Of course you would. I'd be kicking sand on everybody. (laughs) It's just not a way, not the way to go through life. But, (laughs) but it's amazing how many people will test you. It's amazing. And it goes back to just even the TO. I have, there's a philosophy that I, you know, I think everybody at certain, some point you need to be put in your place. And uh, I think that for the most part, 95, if not more percent of people are going to back down from someone who's a bully. And yeah. uh, I, I've tried to live my life as a, as saying that you can only go so far with me and you're not going to bully me uh, mm-hmm. or anybody around me, but. Well, I mean, it's, I mean, I, 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 I joke. I mean, I, the last time I saw you was at uh Brian's birthday and there's a picture that we you and I took and I'm you know I'm well, you're looking and barefoot yeah. and nor, you know I normally walk in like I own the place and then there's you and it's like you're you know from outer space or something man I don't I can't imagine anybody starting anything with you but anyway it's, uh, all fun, it's all fun until you gotta live this way all the all the time <laughs> well you know there's a lot of five foot seven guys out there that trade places with you like that so, a if lot of them in LA. A if lot. We meet, if we could meet in the middle somewhere, yeah. If I, could give you, if I could give you three or four inches and be like six three, six four, yeah, I'd probably do it. Uh, uh, I don't know. I think I think it's cool. But so fourteen. I mean, fourteen years in the NFL with all the politics, just like in everything else, but especially there. You said ten different head coaches. I mean that that's just an eternity. And and. Uh, what, yeah. what would you say was, was your highlight? Uh, I mean, you know, or your favorite place out of all those 14 years. Right. And I, and I obviously have a few, um, you know, uh, I talked about Carolina and, and, and I played in the South, you know, both with Atlanta and, and Carolina. And I think the South is a beautiful place. Um, I really enjoyed my time in Carolina. It comes down to the people that you're with, you know, um, and, and those relationships that you have with your teammates with your coaches, um, again, Carolina was a special place. We ended up going to a Super Bowl and losing, but still had an amazing time um, and, and still have relationships uh, from that time. San Francisco was a great place. Loved the Bay Area. Um, uh, have family up there and uh, really enjoyed my time there. So those two places were probably the, the, the most uh memorable having to experience uh getting to experience uh, the pack the packers and that whole thing and what that was all about and, and their traditions out there mm-hmm. was a real treat i wish i had spent more time had the opportunity to spend more time uh, a few more seasons there but um you know i was blessed man i really was you know I, we've talked about it a while and and, and having 14 years in a career where I wasn't supposed to play any, to be mm-hmm. honest, you know, and I really would, I, I took advantage of opportunities. And yeah, you can say I played for uh, six different teams, which means that I probably wasn't that great of a player. And I, I, I moved around a lot because I wasn't as valuable, but you know what? I was valuable enough to, to land on six different teams and, um, and, you know, play a lot of games and play a lot of football and see a lot of things. And mm-hmm. so I, I can't complain. I really can't, you know, I was able to make a salary for 14 years and uh, have some of the best relationships possible and, um, and see the country and play a game that I loved. And, and, I, and I did end up loving football. Uh, you know, I talked earlier about how it was a struggle and basketball was my love. I ended up love loving playing football. Uh, the politics of it all got in the way sometimes. But, but hell, man, I mean, come on, 14 years playing a kid's game, being in locker rooms, uh, being a silly, silly guy that I naturally am and sort of a class clowny kind of guy. I love to have fun. And I think that goes kind of hand in hand with having a good camaraderie. And so I was always, uh, I was always a leader in that sort of, <laughs> that sort of, yeah, I, 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 I like another reason they kept you around. You know, maybe I, I think that that was I, I, actually part of it is that I was like I said, I, I was good for the team. Um, 
I took the game seriously and, and really wanted to win, but at the same time realized that having fun and, and, and a relaxed sort of atmosphere uh, most of the time was also helpful. And, and so I sort of led that charge. Well, certainly I don't know the percentages, but, you know, top half of 1%, you know, even making it to the NFL in the last 14 years. And I want to, I mean, I've already had you for an hour, so I'll, I'll segue quick. I wanted to talk about, you know, your Hollywood uh, accomplishments as well. So after your football career, how did, obviously you're in LA, um, was it something that you thought about? I know you started working in radio and TV a little bit yeah. uh, during your playing days. How did that yeah, come I, about? I don't want to, I don't, yeah, I, I, we'll, we'll try to cut it up a little bit, but, but yeah, it just came about that, 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 that I started hosting radio and TV shows when I was playing ball. I started hosting a radio show in one city and then helped out with a TV show uh, in San Francisco and sort of just got, or realized anyways from other people that I was very comfortable in front of the camera. I was comfortable talking to people, uh, being on the radio, that kind of thing. And my personality kind of led it to that. Um, uh, one of my brother's girlfriends at the time said, Hey, I got an agent. I know an agent friend who deals with a lot of ex athletes. That's kind of his specialty and you should meet with him. And I met with him kind of late in my career it was, uh, just after I think, um, the 2000, after the Super Bowl with the Rams, Ended up meeting with him and he said, yeah, let's do some things in the, in your off season, you know, where you can just kind of do commercials. And he was my commercial agent. And, uh, and, and so I, I booked my first audition. It was actually a football spot for Camel Soup, mm -hmm. you know, with Kurt Warner, oddly enough. Wow. And then after that, I booked, I think my second or third audition, which was a David Spade commercial for Capital One, which showed for a good year and a half. And as you know, back then, you know, even 20 years ago, God, 20 years ago I started, um, you know, commercials would make you a nice chunk of change. I know, I know. A nice chunk of change. Um, and so just off those alone, I was able to kind of get some momentum. And as you know, you know, you gain some momentum, especially in the commercial world, you kind of, everybody wants to kind of see you and this and that, and you kind of become the it guy for a little while. And so I was able to do dozens of commercials for a while until I retired and I thought, I can either go into what I thought at the time was either going sideline reporting, you know, somewhere in the football realm, or let me see if I got any, any chops and got with an acting coach and started doing it full time. And again, started booking some things, some guest starring roles. Uh, I was just telling my daughter the other day about uh, the show, the West wing and she's 13. She kind of like, yeah, I think I've heard of it. And I, I was a huge fan of the West Wing. And one of my early goals was to get on the West Wing. And I ended up getting on, you know, one of the probably the first, probably first 10 jobs that I had was getting on the West Wing. And funny story was I was scared to death. And I, at that time, you know, I'm still, you know, you still get nervous going into big auditions. But at that time, I was really nervous. And I was playing kind of a professional football player who was announcing the candidates for the West Wing. That time it was Alan Alda and Jimmy Smith. So it was later on in the, in, in the show. Again, long story short, I'm nervous as hell. I walk into the audition and the producer and I think maybe both producers were there. And they said, Matt, relax, you have the job. We're huge New York Jets fans. We remember for you from when you played and we think you're good enough that don't even worry about it. Let's talk football. <laughs> so that was one of the coolest moments that, that, that never happened to me that's weird right. anyway <laughs> See? That, that's where a little of the football came in handy you know I, you I, I, yeah so again uh you know had some great experiences early on started booking some things and um as you know man it's it's an up and down business um i i feel like i've got a little bit of talent and i'm just trying to do the most of it most with it that I can. I talked about, you know, losing some inches and giving some away if, you know, being six, seven, six, eight. Um, although I say I'm six, six and a half uh, officially on my IMDB page. Yeah. Um, but no, yeah. but being that tall obviously cuts, you know, cuts the work. I'll be generous and say in half. Uh, Lay down. Cause, cause look, it, it's six, three and a half. I have the same thing, you know, yeah. it, it, everyone's so short and I can imagine at your size, you know. Yeah, it, it, it does. And, and so, so it, it makes everything that I go on or everything that I audition for that much more important. Um, I've been able to do some amazing, uh, you know, big productions 
uh, have some recurring roles in some things that, that I really, really enjoyed. And you know, I think some of my best work is on some, a couple of films that nobody's seen, you know, where I had the opportunities to kind of be myself and, and you know, interact the way we're interacting. A lot of times I'm not able to do that in, 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 in a production because they want that big, mean, tough guy who doesn't say a lot or who has an accent or, you know, mumbles or whatever, you know how it goes, mm -hmm. so. Well, you know, uh, I'm actually a fan of one of your projects that I that I rewatched again uh, last week when I knew you were coming on. Uh, and again, nobody saw it, and it's 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 dumb, but I really loved that year one. Yeah. With uh, I'm, glad you, I'm glad you said that because that was yeah Jack Black, Michael Sarah. You know, I've I've known Jack for like 15 years almost. Uh, what an incredible opportunity to sit and watch him do his thing and directed by Harold Ramis by the way who again was a kind of a checklist moment to have him uh, direct me uh, where from day one he really got my sort of sports mentality of things mm -hmm. he was a huge sports guy and unfortunately we've lost him but um, from day one he was a big fan of mine and so that whole shoot was amazing and i had to make that character because he allowed me to be able to try to do things and play with that character a little bit where there are certain things in the film which maybe to most people don't mean anything but to me allowed me to kind of have some freedom to say a few things uh improvise a few lines that up to that point i hadn't really had the opportunity uh -huh. to do a lot and kind of made that character sort of a uh, uh, sort of a fun character throughout the movie yeah, I, I mean, I really enjoyed it. And I don't, you know, I'm not always, you know, a big fan of Jack's. I mean, I, I love the guy, right. but, you know, I, right. I, I've never seen a lot of stuff he does. It's just not my thing. But I really liked it. And I like, you know, Mike Estero was in his prime at that, you know, at that, or, you know, at his yeah. goofy teenage. Yeah. And yeah. you were a huge part in it. And I just thought the whole thing worked. I, I don't know uh, how well it did at the time. You know, I saw it later. It didn't, it didn't do very well at all. You know, it's funny because I was, I was thinking year two was coming. <laughs> you <laughs> know, year like, three, year four. Yeah, this kid, this can't miss, you know. Uh, number one, I didn't die in the movie, which is, to, for me, that's, a, that's like a 10% <laughs> probability that, I, or that I'm going to survive something that I do. Um, but it was, it, it, it flopped. And you talk about Jack Black, I, you know, honestly, Honestly, I, I think it might have been a little almost too much Jack Black. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, but again, I thought it was uh, the, the uh, as as you know in this business, sometimes the 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 shooting of it or the the uh, you know the production of it all is either the best thing about it or the worst thing. But but mm -hmm. in this case, uh, being out in uh, in shooting in New Mexico, White Sands, we shot in New Mexico. We uh, shot in North Carolina. We shot in uh, in um, you know in Louisiana. So uh, it was a really a fun time, and and uh, I look fond I look back fondly on that on that uh, production. Yeah, I, and I I mean I recommend to everybody. I I don't know if I saw it on Netflix or Amazon, but I went and found it somewhere pretty easily. It's a uh, funny yeah. movie, it, and there's it, some it is in there. It's really a funny movie. Yeah, year year one. So go check that out. And uh, as, as we wrap up here, I've had you for an hour and 15 minutes. So thank you so much for taking the time. You haven't even I'm good. I'm your sure we're, Moscow I'm, Mule. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure we're boring the hell out of everybody else, but I'm, I'm, I'm really appreciative and it's been really cool so far. Oh, it's great. I mean, and I'm, you'll inspire a lot of people with your, with your story. Um, lastly, would you, would you say that your football career, like going into Hollywood, like, does that help you or hurt you? Or does it, people probably, the reason I ask that, Matt, is, People from the outside look at it, I think, and say, oh, well, he was a football player. You know, of course he's going to get roles. But having done it for 20 years, it doesn't – nobody gives a crap, really. I mean, you mentioned that commercial, but nobody cares in casting that you were an NFL player for 14 years. No. It, it, uh, it, there, there was an in inquisitiveness to it all a little bit at first, I think. Hey, big guy, pretty raw. What, what are his talents? Um, but quickly that, that they don't care. They don't care. Um, they just want to know if you have the goods, if they want to know if you can do it, 
they, they want, you know, they want to know if you're right for the role and whether or not you can uh, pull it off or not. And, uh, you know, I definitely have taken some of what I learned in the sports world and I use it, you know, there's a determination, there's a preparation, there is a, uh, uh, an intensity, all those things that, as an athlete, you, it, it, you know, they, it comes up and it comes down, you know, you, you have to know when to turn it on. You have to know, you know, when to prepare more than you, than you're not, you know, those things definitely have helped me because let's face it. I am a raw actor. I've had acting lessons uh, uh, over the years. There's no question, but, but uh, I do rely on my instincts. I've always been told I had good instincts mm -hmm. and, um, uh, it's just a question of whether I can bring those on on the screen, but, but yeah, I, I've tried to use that uh, because you have to, we all do, you know, we use our experiences and if I'm not going to have an amazing acting school experience or an amazing uh, top five teacher in my life or going to the actor's studio or things like that, then what am I going to use? I'm going to use my experiences. Mm -hmm. Um, that I've had that have gotten me here, you know, and, and so, yeah, I've, I've, I've been able to use some, again, it's the big difference is, is to me is finding that quietness in myself because I do tend to have a, a, a pretty good personality. For me, the biggest thing is trying to find the quiet side of me uh, and the calm side of me that, that really helps me uh, the most when I'm on screen. And, and one thing that, that, you know, just talking to you, um, you clearly have a way of, of attaining your goals. And I just think that's fantastic because so many people, you know, don't even try for their, their dreams. And you've had these crazy dream jobs that you've, that, you know, mastered. Right. And it, that's so incredible. And I know you don't see yourself like that. But from the outside right. looking in and just see all you've done, I mean, do you have a process or, or do you ever feel intimidated? Like, how do you set a goal? Do you visualize it? You know, how do you go about attaining it? I try to micromanage it. It's the best way I can say it because I, I, I do get very, I, I number one, people, my, my friends around me now have said, uh, you know, you're so, you, you know, you don't take enough credit for what you've done. And that's true. I, I have a very, I still have a very sort of low opinion of that because and I think like all people that are successful in anything, mm -hmm. you see what you haven't done and you see what's out there that you haven't accomplished. And, you know, do I wish that I had uh, produced a couple of films at this point? Absolutely. Do I get scared to go pitch a project to somebody and get off my ass and do it? Absolutely. You know, uh, do I fail sometimes in not following through with people in the industry where I should? Absolutely. Um, you know, I there's a buddy of mine that I work with who's been in the industry on and off for a long time who says, Matt, you need to have a show. And why you're not having a show, why you are doing the steps to have a show is insane. And he's right. And again, these are things that I kind of constantly battle with. Um, but but again, my process is trying to trying to keep it simple. If, if I got to make a phone call today, that that's my focus. If, if, you know, whether, and I try to do it, I just wrote something down today. I wrote like five things I got to do in the next week. Um, and they're little things, but those little things are going to get me to the bigger thing. And so that's kind of do, cause I, I, I tend to get overwhelmed by the big picture. I think cause we all do, you know, Oh shit. I should have, I should, I should be putting a show on YouTube. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you've just done something. Why can't, why shouldn't I be doing it? So it's, it's things like that, that I battle with all the time mm -hmm. um, that, uh, that, that bother me, you know, but again, <laughs> Hey man, character flaws are what makes you. Yeah. Well, um, I, in, in closing, I'll, I'll tell this really quick story um, because it's in line of like inspiring and what we try to do here. Um, I was in a bar in Los Angeles on a Sunday morning, nine o'clock March madness. And I was talking to this guy, this chubby guy, he was an actor. And I was talking to him for half the day, didn't know who he was. And he was from Washington State, you know, had a camouflage hat on. You know, I'm from Texas. We just immediately just hit it off and uh, hung out with him. I didn't know who he was. We were both actors, talked a little bit of industry. And he told me what changed his life was he got this vision board. And he started, he, he wrote down 
you know, that he wanted, he was on the TV show now, but he wanted more. And it turned out the guy was Chris Pratt, you know, who was on Parks and Rec at the time. That next year, he lost 40 pounds, became this huge action star. And he laid it all out for me at that bar that day, that that was his plan and it was on his vision board. So what did I do? I went out and got a vision board and it worked for me too. And so I tell that story to people who procrastinate and have struggle, who have a time, you know, tough time, you know, motivating themselves. But anyway, well, I didn't I'm, mean I'm, 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 I'm taking that and I'm pulling it in and I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get a vision board. <laughs> it, I'm gonna start with that. It works because you, you know, you put it by the TV, you see it every day and it's just right wow. there. There you go. <clears throat> but anyway, I could talk to you another hour. I'm gonna let you go. I appreciate your time. Uh, and next time I'm in LA, maybe we can grab a drink or something and uh, try to stay out of the, the rioting out there. <laughs> I will try. Listen, thanks for talking with me. I hope that it was uh, somewhat informative. Again, bottom line is that I've just tried to put my head down and grind. And I think uh, when you do that and, and you try to be as nice to people as you can, good things happen. Good things will happen. And, uh, and, I, and I've tried to live by that. And, and like I said, I've been pretty fortunate. Thanks, Dale. I appreciate uh, you, you having me on and uh, hope to see you soon, brother. All right. Words of wisdom. Take care, Maddie. Thank you, buddy.